global anti-Semitism, a crisis of modernity. I can't see more available. It's available now on the internet. These books will be on our website shortly, and they'll be available as e-books. And you can download them for free, in theory. And you can buy them. You'll be able to buy them on Amazon for a small fee as well. So the, the, the conference dealt with issues of global anti-Semitism, a crisis of modernity. I can't see more. I can see everybody. Now I can't see Mary. <laughs> A small group, I guess. Um, so essentially, the, the conference and, and this, this paper that I'm presenting here is an attempt to understand anti Semitism in a comprehensive analytical framework. Much of the work in anti Semitism studies is, is, I would argue, descriptive and not analytical, and it's mostly historical. And in a sense, what we're trying, what I'm trying to do in my work is to look at not global anti-Semitism, but globalization and anti-Semitism. So the processes of globalization, which is transforming the world, um, is having an impact on issues of cultural identity, economic and social processes, which are leading to, on the one hand, increased marginalization and of, of, of populations, and on the other hand, it's bringing, to pe bringing people together as never before. So, for example, through the internet, through telecommunications, uh, through economic processes, people are coming together and, as never before. People are consuming uh, products and uh, having consumer uh, patterns, if you will, that are similar. So you could be sitting in Cape Town, you could be in Warsaw, you could be in New York, and you could be basically consuming similar products, similar cars, similar food and the like. And in, in globalization, the process of globalization, the more global you are, the more connected you are, the more power you have. The more that you're stuck in time and space, the more you're on the receiving end of neoliberal globalization. And in a sense, there's increased marginalization, increased poverty, increased malnutrition, increased wealth in the smaller sector of the global population, and in a sense, there's the core, the periphery, and the Jews, I would argue, are once again in the middle. And this is sort of the, the context in which I'm trying to analyze anti-Semitism. So, looking at globalization and anti-Semitism, and what I call the crisis of modernity, which is currently affecting the core elements of Western society and civilization. It is, it is possible that the emergence of the current wave of global anti-Semitism both reflects and forms part of the wider attack on the core elements to the core aspects of modernity, notions of enlightenment, and Western civilization more generally by reactionary social movements, which is empowered by the crisis of capitalism. Against this background, or this backdrop, I want to analyze anti-Semitism, contemporary anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism is a complex and at times perplexing form of hatred. Some observers, like what Robert Wistroth call, call it the longest hatred. It spans centuries, infecting different societies, religions, philosophical and political movements, and even civilization. In the aftermath of the Holocaust, some have argued that anti-Semitism illustrates the limitations of enlightenment and modernity itself, at the core of our civilization. Manifestations of anti-Semitism occur in numerous ideologically based narratives, and is constructed and, and in constructed identities of belonging and otherness, such as race, ethnicity, as well as nationalist and even anti-nationalist movements. In the contemporary context of globalized relations, it appears that anti-Semitism has taken on a new and complex and changing form that needs to be decoded, mapped, and exposed. The, the academic study of anti-Semitism, like prejudice more generally, has a long and impressive intellectual history. It remains a topic of ongoing uh, importance politically and scholarly, at a scholarly level and at a political level. However, especially at this important historical juncture, unlike prejudice and discrimination directed at other social groups, anti-Semitism in particular, in particular its contemporary form and the processes surrounding it, is almost always studied outside the organized academic framework. 
And in fact, I think anti-Semitism is, is, uh, is essentially a taboo. Contemporary anti-Semitism is a taboo. And in a sense, what we're trying to do at ISGAP is to break the taboo, and the taboo is especially difficult, I'd say, and serious within the academy and with in so-called liberal institutions, especially in the West, and I would say even in particular in the United States uh, in, in comparison to even other Western countries. The processes of globalization has led to an increase in adversarial identity politics. In this environment, Israel, as a central manifestation of contemporary Jewish identity, and Jews more generally, have become the focus uh, of scapegoating and hateful rhetoric. At, um, at a more structural, socio-historical socio level, the old ideologies and tendencies of anti-Semitism has re-emerged as being fused with anti-Zionism or Israel bashing, um, or Israel bashing. The old theological and racist forms of European anti-Semitism are being amalgamated with anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli pronoun anti pronouncements emanating in particular from the Muslim world, which is located mainly but not exclusively in and around the Middle East, around Israel. Contemporary globalizations and the related uh, socioeconomic, cultural, and political processes are being fused with these historical tendencies creating the conditions that pose a significant threat to the Jewish people and Jewish communities in the diaspora. In addition, new structural realities within the realm of international relations and the emergence of anti-Israel propensities appear to pose a threat to Israel and the Jewish people in a manner not seen since the end of the Second World War. Once again, in this age of globalization, the Jewish people seem to be caught between the aristocracy or the wealthy establishment, or the core, and, uh, and the marginalized or disenfranchised masses, or the periphery, as they have been throughout much of history. Um, and I'll just say, I was having a conversation with a scholar in Canada today, and it's, it's fascinating how um, Netanyahu is being perceived as hysterical, the Israeli intelligence have been called liars, and those who consider stopping Iran's um, procurement of uh, nuclear weapons as warmongers. So hysterical, warmongers, and liars. These are all old anti-Semitic tropes which are alive and well in this country in particular. Uh, and is taking on, I would argue, a very uh, a rapid, uh, things are, are, are speeding up. The processes of anti-Semitism have sped up. So in a sense, with the advent of what Babel called the socialism of fools, a term describing the replacement of a, a real search for social and political equity with anti-Semitism is frequently attributed, attributed to August Babel. Jews, Jews continue to be targeted. In much the same way, the current marginalization of the Jewish people in the Arab world, or more accurately, the marginalization of the image of the Jew, the image of the Jew, because the Jews have been expelled from Arab countries, um, it is becoming more antagonistic. And of course, the, the, the Jewish refugees from the, these countries is a whole matter that is also part of a taboo in the academy. As the social movement in the Middle East has turned to their own version of the socialism and fools, the anti-Semitism of radical political Islamism, when I refer to Islamism, I'm not referring to Islam and I'm not referring to Muslims. I'm speaking about a reactionary social movement that is using Islam uh, to establish a political authority. They've incorporated lethal forms of European genocidal anti-Semitism as their fuel. However, many scholars, policymakers, and journalists of record still refuse to acknowledge the fact, this fact and to critically examine the ideology, the mission, of the social movement. Now, I wrote this months ago, this paragraph, but imagine, Ayatollah Khomeini, the day before the Obama administration implemented this interim, interim agreement with the Iranian revolutionary regime, basically said that the Jews and the Israelis are dogs that will be destroyed. Their destruction is imminent. And there was not a word from the Obama administration, not from Kerry, not from anybody, and 24 hours later after this rant, the, 
the, the six, the P5 plus one, signed an interim agreement with a regime that is openly and, and consistently and uh, clearly genocidal, and I'm using the word carefully, in its anti-Semitism. So the decoupling of human rights, the decoupling and not even you know, dealing with this taboo subject of anti-Semitism in the Middle East. It, it's, it's off the record. Instead, we're dealing with liars and hysterical leaders and war mongers. So anti-Judaism is one of the most perplexing uh, forms of hatred. Um, it's a, a term that was described or coined by Wilhelm Marr in the 1870s, as it, uh, uh, in, in the 1870s. Yet, despite this etymological limitations and contradictions, it remains a valid and useful term. The term refers specifically to prejudice and discrimination against the Jewish people. Some incorrectly or for reasons of political expedience use the term to refer to prejudice, to refer, refer to prejudice against the so-called Semitic peoples, claiming that Arabs cannot be anti-Semites because they are se they're Semites themselves. This is clearly a uh, political twist to the reality and uh, it's a, a, uh, an attempt to weaken the term of anti-Semitism, as we know. So, so this is a, a, a in terms of anti-Semitism, is etymologically problematic, but it's a, a form of hatred geared specifically uh, towards the Jewish people. So, in a sense, uh, in a very, in a very brief sense, anti-Semitism can be seen as entering, uh, comprising of three major areas, three major historical areas. There was the religious forms of anti-Semitism, mainly European Christianity, and when the dominant uh, way of perceiving reality was through the lens of Christianity, through the lens of, of religion, the Jews were the wrong religion. Not only were they the wrong religion, they were a people that were blinded by evil for not accepting the Christian Messiah, the Jesus Christ as the Messiah. They were perceived as stubborn, and not only were they perceived as stubborn and blinded, world redemption, the redemption not just of the Jew, but of the world was bound up in the acceptance or the potential acceptance of the Jewish people to accepting Christ. So the fact that the Jews were stubborn and didn't accept Christ not only prevented their redemption, but prevented world redemption. When the lens of uh, reality was viewed through the, do the dominant lens of reality was viewed through the notions of race and ethnicity, and biologically determined forms of identity, the Jews were suddenly a people that lived in places and nations and lands for generations. They were suddenly the wrong nations. After all, race and nation and ethnicity are socially constructed uh, categories. So, unlike during the times of religion, when things became racist, the Jews weren't afforded the capacity to convert to save themselves, which many did because you can't convert out of the racial category. So in other, in other words, to, to, to save the nation, to save the race, the Jewish people that were contaminating the race and contaminating the nation had to be expunged and eliminated, physically eliminated and, and killed in order to save the nation. So there's something inherently genocidal, and I think it's unique in anti-Semitism that there's something inherently uh, uh, genocidal in that Somehow, the Jews need to change to save the world, and this, what, this is what makes, I think, anti-Semitism unique and inherently, if you will, genocidal. And in a sense, the new contemporary form of, of, of anti-Semitism is also genocidal because radical Islamists perceive that the world will be saved and Islam will dominate the world if the Zionist entity will be removed. And there are even people in the West uh, people, real, the so-called realists, who also believe that radical Islam, jihadism, the instability of the world in the Middle East will go away if only the stubborn Jews change their policies. Uh, and some of these people are, are important uh, people in Washington today. Brzezinski, for example, a graduate of my uh, McGill University, where I went to school, believe this uh, very adamantly, uh, I think up until at least recently, that if the Israelis would change their policy, would change the settlement policy, that jihadism would be would stop being a threat to 
the Western world. So sort of blaming the victim, but also blaming the stubborn Jews. So there's something that is taking place in the contemporary context which is linked to the genocidal forms of anti-Semitism. And we see in, in Islamic societies where radical Islam is filling this vacuum that, um, that the old anti-Semitism of Europe is being fused into the mainstream, the mainstream of the political uh, and even uh, culture of, the, of these societies. So we see like, the protocols of the elders of Zion and the European narrative uh, of anti-Semitism anti entering into mainstream uh, Arab societies and Muslim societies. And what's interesting and, and, and very important to remember is that the protocols of the elders of Zion played a very important role in marginalizing the Jews of Europe. So the concentration camps didn't begin with the bricks and mortars of the camps or the railroad tracks. It began with words and ideas and this, this fake uh, narrative that came out of Russia or France in the 1890s helped to marginalize the Jews and justify uh, the Holocaust. This is a key element of the Holocaust. This is now becoming, and I'm not exaggerating or being melodramatic, I'm speaking now as a serious scholar. If you read the works of Jeffrey Herf, Bassam Tibi, uh, Mayor Litvak, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion has now entered into the mainstream political discourse and even cultural discourse of many societies, and is certainly if you, if you hear the, the, the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood, um, if you hear the ideology of the, of, the, of the Iranian Revolutionary Regime, the protocols has been fused with their sort of extreme is forms of Islam or Islamism. And this is forming a, a, a core element of their ideology. Um, so you hear the pronouncements of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, and you hear the narrative of the protocols. And even if you look at the Hamas Charter, in the Charter, not the rantings and ravings of the extreme fringe or the military wing, but the covenant of Hamas, you see through, through it the, 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 uh, the themes running throughout the covenant of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. So here is a, a social movement that wants to rid the world, or rid the Islamic world of any influence from the outside, from Jews, Christians, capitalism, communism, but they're using the most pernicious form of uh, anti-Semitism, of European anti-Semitism, in the core uh, elements of their ideology. And this goes back, if you read uh, Qutub and Al-Banai, and uh, sort of the founding uh, fathers of radical Islam, you see that they were influenced by the Nazis and uh, European anti-Semitism. So this theme is uh, powerful. The context of global anti-Semitism, um, we're watching, we're witnessing an increasingly, we're, we're, there's the global economy and political world is in a state of flux and turmoil. Notions of tolerance, democratic principles, and the ideals of human rights and robust citizenship is on retreat. And I, and I say this, uh, you know, and I think you can see the, the, the distinctions where the, the, the interim agreement with Iran, there is absolutely no dealing with issues of human rights. And I think there's been, there's been a complete uh, betrayal of international human rights, if you will. According to the UN Security Council on International Law, Iran does not have the right to, to process uranium on its soil. This is international law, completely ignored by this interim agreement. Um, the Canadian government is actually lodging complaints on this issue as we speak. Um, and of course, the human rights violations in Iran are off the charts. The, the country that has the highest levels of um, executions, political prisoners, the, per the persecution of religious minorities, this is off the table. So these values appear to be receding within many institutions and within many societies. And while the international com community seems to be less strident in trying to defend them, it would appear that the Jew, or perhaps more importantly, the, the image of the Jew, or the imaginary Jew, as described by the philosopher Alan Finkelkraut, is at the middle of this global moment. Both historically and, and in the contemporary context, anti-Semitism is a social disease that begins with Jews. And this is very important, but it never ends with them, making the Jewish people the proverbial canary in the coal mine. 
The deadly strain of hatred often turns against other groups such as women, gay people, moderate Muslims, and other sectors of the population that are not perceived as being ideologically pure, as well as key concepts or democratic notions such as a robust form of citizenship, equality under one legal system, and notions of religious pluralism. Anti-Semitism, consequently, must be understood as a key element in the universal human rights and the whole quest for human rights. This is not a parochial Jewish problem, this is a problem of international human rights. In view of the character of this longest hatred with a destructive power that is both well known and well documented, documented the historical lessons of anti-Semitism ought to reach beyond the Jewish people and concern scholars from a wide range of disciplines, both academic and policy oriented. In fact, anti-Semitism should be perceived as a key, as a key aspect in the, in the development of Western civilization. It is often perceived as a Jewish or parochial issue. This perception forms an, an impediment in the study of anti-Semitism in the current academic culture, which favors the universal over the particular. In fact, the study of anti-Semitism is often regarded as an unworthy, unworthy of consideration, or even as an enemy of progressive, universalist uh, worldview that is currently in vogue. So this is, uh, in, in a sense, the, the, the environment in which we are currently engaged. Certain members of the academic community, especially those who claim to espouse so-called progressive and or postmodern views, are often perceive the study as an attempt to undermine criticism of the state of Israel and to, to accuse those engaged in the study of being political advocates rather than the pursuers of true scholarship. In fact, in this postmodern age or in this postmodern moment, it is fairly a common view in the academic, this is a fairly common view in the academic and intellectual circles in the West. So on the one hand, we have the rise of radical political Islam growing rapidly taking over institutions and now even societies. And on the other hand, we have a sort of postmodern moment where people don't really want to engage critically in the study of societies that were once colonized because that's perceived as being reactionary. It is therefore important to embark on a systematic critique of the intellectual and political impact of this philosophical moment, not only with regard to the safety and security of the Jewish people, and their right to self-determination, but also with regard to the integrity of the Enlightenment project and perceptions of modernity. The contemporary canon, intellectual canon or philosophical canon, includes a critique of the traditional Western canon, for example, by Michel Foucault and Edward Said, that it, which has also helped this, all, their work, I would argue, would also help to demonize the Jewish cultural and historical narratives in relation to Israel and beyond. And what's also important to note is that the Jewish people through the state of Israel are the only others, the only non-Muslim to have Muslims to have self-determination on so-called Islamic land. This perspective is now an integral component of many good university curricula. Sorry. Uh, just lost my space. It is therefore important to embark on a systematic critique of the intellectual and political impact of the philosophical moment, not only with regard to the safety and security of the Jewish people, as I said, but also to the, but also to the notions of modernity and the Enlightenment project itself. The contemporary canon, including the, the critique of Foucault and Said, is this perspective that is now an integral component of many good universities' curriculum throughout the Western world. Foucault, for example, welcomed the Iranian Revolution of 1979 as a triumph of the spiritual values, and I quote, the spiritual values over the profanity of Western capitalist materialism. He perceived the Islamist revolution as a critique of, the, of Western culture and a protest against the, the political rationality of modernity. This sympathetic view of the Islamist revolution has been largely ignored by the academy, but has undoubtedly has influenced, and su influenced the subsequent philosophical discourse of scholarship. Edward Said, who was also in Paris with Foucault in 1979, fondly recalled spending the time with Michel Foucault and notes that they both hoped that the Iranian Revolution would develop into what the French Revolution was to Immanuel Kant 200 years earlier. Despite its violence, 
Foucault and Said hoped that the revolution would be a crucial step towards the, the progress and emancipation for not only the people of Iran, but oppressed peoples in other nations. Their critique of modernity and Western colonial power, combined with a lack, a lack of an ethical alternative, prevented these early postmodernists from criticizing the excesses of the Iranian Revolution and its failure to recognize the other as an equal and respected member of society. The works of Foucault and Said have helped to lay the foundation for the failure, the failure of many contemporary intellectuals to condemn the rise of radical political Islam as a social movement, especially in relation to the lack of acceptance of basic notions of otherness within Islamic society, a cornerstone of democratic principles, and its vitriolic prejudice against the Jewish people in Israel. His intellectual development should also be considered in the context of global politics and the prevailing environment in many academic institutions where the need for funding unfortunately, unfortunately appears to be having a growing impact on curriculum. So there's, there's this moment, if you will, intellectually, where we critique, you know, so in a sense, postmodernism e emerges after World War II, after the profound excesses of nationalism and racism, and intellectuals in the post-World War II moment, after the Shoah, begin to critique colonialism, begin to critique racism and gender inequalities, and, and critique the canon of Western thought, which I think is worthy and, and has its, you know, throw the baby out of the bathwater. But at the same time, it's impossible, if you will, it's a taboo to critique those who were once colonized. So it's, and, and when we were at Yale, our center was at Yale, we ran into this moment. And I remember, I was just speaking about this today, there was uh, three years ago, there was a Passover uh, at the Slivka Center. They invited 50 scholars from Yale to discuss notions of freedom on the eve of Passover. And three years ago, everybody was speaking about the Arab Spring and freedom. And professors were saying that we should set a table for the uh, Arab Spring for the people in Tara Square. Uh, we should set a table for them, uh, a chair for them at the Seder table. This is all about freedom. And everybody was going on and on about the wonderful possibilities of the Arab Spring. And I asked the professors, these were serious professors, I asked them if anybody could please refer to one study, one study, which shows what is the agenda and what is the, the interest, the mission of the people protesting. Because we saw on CNN, on the BBC, on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, these wonderful images and exciting images, we all were rushing home at night to watch the news, of uh, these journalists running through the square with people, tens, hundreds of thousands of people chanting. It was very exciting. But what do they want? And nobody at that table read one study. These are leading Yale professors, not one could quote the study. And I then said that I, all I heard from these squares, from these images, very exciting images, I kept hearing you know, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. And I read René Descartes, and I read Karl Marx, and I read the founding fathers of Enlightenment liberalism, and I had no, I had no, I was looking at my indexes of all my books, there wasn't one reference to Allah Akbar. You know, so what was happening? And I'll, I'll say this uh, emphatically, we need to really begin to study and to learn and to become fluent in the language of what is happening in the Middle East. We need to understand, we don't have to agree with them, we can agree with them, we can have an argument, but we need to become fluent in what this ideology is all about. What is the objective? What do they want? What do they think of democracy? What do they think of the West? What do they think of minorities, of Jews, of Baha'is? What do they think of moderate, uh, secular Muslims? What do they think of Sufis? What do they think of gay people? We need to become fluent in their worldview, and we are imposing these sort of fictitious, happy ending stories on, on things we know nothing about. And we need to become uh, fluent in learning about what this ideology is all about. So, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, and despite the ac ac uh, Academy's 
preoccupation with colonialism, racism, and sexism, and inequality, and critical understandings of otherness, anti-Semitism, especially contemporary manifestation, does not exist as an area of study in mainstream academic curriculum, which is astounding given the history of anti-Semitism in the West. Unlike other forms of discrimination, anti-Semitism is not an, an issue of significant concern. These developments have had an effect on placing, on, uh, placing attempts to defend the Jews and their legitimate connection to Israel and Jerusalem outside the realms of what is acceptable and proper. This is most troubling given the legacy of anti-Semitism in the academy and Western civilization more generally that has yet to be understood and addressed in the same way that other forms of discrimination and hatred have been. The, con the contemporary perception in some quarters of the Zionist movement as an unfashionable, intellectually defunct, and morally bankrupt remnant of Western colonialist racist culture, a perception that pays no attention in the competing narrative of Jewish aspirations or the Jewish people's millennial spanning history in the region is therefore a recipe for disaster. <coughs> and one point, if you, if you may, uh, I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement. And could you imagine if a white or a Europe, person of European descent who was a leader of an African country would come to the United States and try to make political arrangements or economic relations with this country, and the country was based on an ideology that believed that all Africans were the descendants of apes and pigs. I assume, and I would certainly hope, that this leader would be sent packing. And yet, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Iranian Revolutionary Regime believes that Jews are the descendants of apes and pigs, and pardon my language, but also emanate from the urine of donkeys. Okay? This is the theology. This is what Western nations are now engaging with uh, at this moment, which is astounding. It's astounding the silence of scholars and human rights activists and even members of the Jewish community is astounding. At the very least, anti-Semitism creates an uncritical blind spot for the role so the sort of postmodern moment is creating a blind spot for the role that anti-Semitism plays in the Middle East and in contemporary global politics. To engage in the study of anti-Semitism is somehow perceived as being supportive of the Zionist narrative, which is the, which, while the real threat of anti-Semitism that which it poses is not only understood and no policies are developed to or addressed to it. So it's not being uh, taken seriously. In this environment, it is more acceptable to study the role of the church and the role of fascism as in, in, in terms of anti-Semitism rather than the contemporary forms of anti-Semitism. And I think what is very important to realize is that when theology, when the anti-Semitic theology was um, dominant, or when racist anti-Semitism was dominant, it was pervasive. If you were a theologian that believed that Jews could be, uh, could find truth or God, there was no role or no place for you essentially in the church. If you were a scholar like W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, who went against the, the racist beliefs in science and humanities and theology in the universities in this country, there was no jobs for you at the time. And I, I, I'm I think that this new anti-Semitism, uh, contemporary forms of anti-Semitism, is beginning to become pervasive. And if you're a young student on campus, so in the past you were you were you weren't on campus, but the Jews were racially inferior, or problematic. They were they were, were accused of uh, committing diocide. The worst epithets you can hurl at people today on campus is to be racist to be a colonial occupying force, to be a supporter of apartheid. There's no greater insults in this political and philosophical moment. And this is the accusation that more and more students and more and more scholars are being met with on campuses. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing more insulting to be on the receiving end of these type of insults in this, in this sort of philosophical and political moment. And this is what we are facing in terms of anti-Semitism. 
So it's not uncommon to find scholars and institutions that are opposed to the study of contemporary anti-Semitism, uh, yet still blame Israel for the renewed prevalent for its renewed prevalence. There's even people studying anti-Semitism who are blaming Israel, blaming Israel and Zionism for creating anti-Semitism. The response is not based on a sound academic analysis, but nonetheless finds appreciative academic audience in some in some cases enjoys the blessing of university administrations eager to receive the funding from Gulf states or to avoid uh, confronting inconvenient truths in the academy. Um, so we also have, for example, people, important scholars like uh, Judith Butler, who's a leading ph philosopher and feminist scholar, who freely says, and openly says, that Hamas and Hezbollah should be perceived as part of the progressive left. Imagine. So a leading, a leading scholar, an intelligent scholar, um, believing this type of thing. So this is the environment. Maybe she's right looking at the, looking at the left today. Maybe she's correct. Pardon me? If you look at the left today, maybe she's correct. That's a scary <coughs> This is true. So Daniel Siboney, a French philosopher and psychoanalyst, provides interesting analysis uh, in terms of this elite, the, 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 this elite, uh, the moment in elite institutions. Siboney contends that deep down, those who insist on ignoring radical political Islam and its reactionary agenda are actually anti-Muslim themselves. The silencing of scholars and human rights activists who are concerned about anti-Semitism in the Middle East or human rights in the Middle East is a manifestation of a deep fear, or what Siboney uh, calls a phobia of the Islamic world. The fear, which is combined with a deep guilt over, over the West colonial legacy in the Middle East, is powerful. As a result, there is a tendency in certain circles to tolerate and justify reactionary Islamic attitudes, including sexism, homophobia, and anti-Semitism, despite their so-called liberal views. It is thus more convenient to blame the Jews for the stalemate in the Middle East and other related problems. Siboney traces this, traces this to a colonial mentality of not expecting the peoples of the Middle East and other parts of the world to adhere to the same criteria of human rights and civility as the so-called civilized West. He points out that these, those who, who continue to highlight these contradictions and dangers eventually come to perceive, are, are, sorry, eventually are, uh, are come to be perceived as the problem and are targeted instead, which is interesting. Siboney goes further stating that there is an emerging fascination in the West with the genocidal anti-Semitic anti narrative of radical political Islamism as, as, as expressed by the Brotherhood or the Iranian regime or other Salafists. In a similar vein, Colin Schindler argues that the growing so-called Red-Green Alliance has come, to, has come to see the displaced and marginalized members of the Islamic world as part of the new proletariat who deserve Western liberal support and even admiration. Anyone perceived as being critical of the new Islamic proletariat is immediately branded as reactionary. It is in this intellectual climate, uh, intellectual climate voices condemning brutality, anti-democratic practices, sexism, homophobia, opposition <coughs> to minority rights, and other violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are silenced, while expressions of genocidal anti-Semitism are disseminated as poor trans are, are, are dismissed as poor translations and or the hysterical rhetoric, fa rhetoric fashioned by the Zionist defenders of Israel. This is what makes the task at hand, namely to produce high caliber scholarship and effective policy development and analysis for dealing with contemporary anti-Semitism, in particular its, poten its potentiality for genocide, all the more challenging but all the more urgent. So I will end, I'm just going to make uh, s simple uh, statements on the whole, the on notions of modernity. So, uh, modernity refers to the processes which led to the specific and distinctive characteristics of modern society. In this context, the concept of modernity is not simply referred to a phenomenon of contemporary origin. It possesses an analytical and conceptual value that embodies the defining characteristics of modern society. 
According to Stuart Hall, these characteristics include, and I'll name four, the dominance of secular forms of political power and authority, and conceptions of sovereignty and legitimacy operating within defined theoretic of defined territorial boundaries, which are characteristic of the large complex structures of the modern nation state. Two, a monetarized exchange economy based on large scale production and the consumption of commodities for the market, extensive ownership and private property, and the accumulation of capital on a systemic long term basis. Three, the decline of the traditional social order, which, is, which has fixed social hierarchies, overlapping allegiances, and the appearance of a dynamic social and sexual division of labor. In modern capitalist societies, there was this, this was characterized by new uh, forms of class identities and a distinctive uh, patriarchal relations between men and women. And fourth, the decline of the religious worldview typical of traditional societies and the rise of the secular materialist culture exhibiting those individual uh, exhibiting individualistic rationalist and instrumental impulses which is now um, common so in other words the crisis of modernity of global capitalism with 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 the intensive marginalization taking place particularly in Islamic societies like Syria, like Sudan, and others, where the state is retreating, where states are actually becoming non-functional, societies are disintegrating. So on the one hand, you have these states uh, going, the, the, this vacuum which is being created is being filled by radical political Islam. And what's also interesting is that neoliberal uh, policies of economic development of the last 20 or 30 years, Reaganomics and Thatcherism, if you want, um, also believes the notion that you need to weaken the state to allow the free flow of capital uh, to come into societies and to create democracy. So Western neoliberals are advocating the, the decline of the power of the state within societies. There should be a free market system that will somehow inherently bring democratic practices to bear. And on the same hand, on the other hand, you have radical political Islam that sees the state as the vestiges of Western colonial imperial power that needs to be destroyed. So you have two great forces destroying the state, and I would argue that the state plays an important role in mediating cleavages and conflicts in society, creating uh, a homogeneous identity, if you will, so that despite our backgrounds, we can have a strong identity surrounding the state. So as the state weakens, there's this vacuum that's being filled by radical political Islam. And I submit to you, I don't see the solution on the horizon as the states and societies are fragmenting into uh, Societies based on religion, based on clans, and, and the like. So this is the perfect storm, if you will, for all sorts of abuses of human rights, and certainly um, the increase of anti-Semitism in a structural way, not in a in a descriptive, in a descriptive way, but something structural is taking place. And I think anti-Semitism is at its core. So I'll leave it there, and you're welcome to ask questions or write criticism. I was struck by your comments, uh, essentially talking about the Obama administration's uh, literally attacking Israel and Israel's leaders as part of classic anti-Semitism, and they're trying to defend themselves against the threat of Iran. And couple that with the silence of Iran's uh, multiple verbal attacks on um, uh, Israel and, and Jews, uh, makes you wonder where, where are human rights in this country? What happened to the United States as being the bastion of freedom and human rights? It seems like it's gone. Yeah, well, I yeah, can't argue with that. It's troubling. It's really troubling. And, and, you know, as Ruth Weiss and other people have argued that anti Semitism or the Jew is the canary in the coal mine, uh, Ruth Weiss says not only is anti Semitism or the Jew the canary in the coal mine, but the Jew is also the kindling that people want to set the entire society on fire. And it's not a parochial issue, and I think the longer we ignore it internationally and even within our community, 
from the economy, uh, the more damage this is going to do. And I, I honestly, unfortunately, see these processes speeding up rapidly, rapidly. And it's going to become more and more unpleasant uh, in terms of geopolitical politics in the Middle East, and it's going to become more and more unpleasant on campuses as you know these messages are being um, received. And I think people are going to be crawling out from under their rocks, if, if you will, and the, the environment is going to become more difficult. Could you talk more about what's happening in Lebanon and In the United States? Yes. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, I, I can, uh, one incident that happened, I, I gave a seminar at Hillel before, we give the seminar at, at the Harvard Law School, I meet with a group of young students at Harvard. And there was a young, brilliant student, really nice guy, smart guy, who's doing a master's degree at the Divinity School looking at Jewish and Islamic thought. And the kid is brilliant. And he was quoting uh, an Islamic scholar from Iran, who I happen to know and have read his stuff. Uh, and he's basically in charge of uh, religious affairs of the regime, the current regime. And he per uh, personally played a role in having moderate Ayatollahs, religious leaders in Iran executed. And he writes beautiful stuff about international brotherhood and international peace. And you know, so I was critiquing the regime and this young brilliant kid was saying, but hey, this Ayatollah is, uh, you know, and, and this is what he's learning in school. This is what progressive liberal postmodern intellectuals are te teaching this kid. And it's astounding. You know, so, the, the, the regime that is openly, and, and in their words, uh, inciting to genocide, inciting to exterminate 7 million Jews in the Middle East and perhaps beyond, but certainly in the Middle East, is being touted by leading scholars at Harvard University as moderate, peace-loving people. Um, and when you go up against this uh, ideological wall, it's difficult. And this, so that, this is happening intellectually. And uh, yesterday at the University of Michigan, I received uh, from my friend's son, he received an eviction notice. Uh, so pro Palestinian groups are putting eviction notices on Jewish students' rooms in dormitories at the University of Michigan. It's happened elsewhere in the United States. Uh, because they are protesting Palestinian rights. And this is what the Israelis are currently doing to Palestinians. So pro-Palestinians are doing this to Jewish American kids on, in dorms at good universities. It happened at Rutgers as well. It happened at Rutgers, it's, it's happened at Concordia, it's happening more and more all over. So so as this message, as, as Iran and people who have no regard for human rights, no regard for religious pluralism, who speak openly about exterminating Jews, exterminating Jews, openly. And they are welcomed as moderate by the political leaders of this country or and other European countries. And this sort of uh, movement at the grassroots, which is labeling Jews as racist, well, Israel's an apartheid racist state. This is the, you can't get more insulting than that in this historical moment. And Jewish kids are going to school, and this is what they're being accused of. And when the Obama administration and other, and, and, and the British government and the French government, the German government and others embrace these people as moderates, uh, it's creating an impact, I would say, on campuses. And it's, I assume, will get worse. It's getting worse. So it's a serious issue.
and when I had published a book. And I had to make a decision. Where would I go? And then in comes Serene, the president of Human Theological Seminary. Serene, who is the president of uh, Union Theological Seminary. And the minute I said, I have a conflict, I have been here now for socialized, but I have to go now. Because in my heart, I know, as a US citizen, as a person, that there's not enough support in, for the Jews in our nation and what they're going through and what they're going through. And I would love to just sit there, you know, and enjoy their program so very much. But I told her, I have to go because it's very serious. And all the things that you have been presenting, it was very right for me to come here. And she, before I said, you know, it was very serious for me to go, she gasped and she said, you're not leaving, are you? And I, and I had to, you know, go up against the president of the Union Theological Seminary and tell her, yes, I am going. And, and I'm going to be supporting uh, the, the Jews down the for the university's meeting this evening, and it's very important that I do so. And I, I had gone um, just a few days ago to the United Nations meeting that honored genocide, that topic, 65th anniversary, with um, very, very disturbing um, non-answers to questions. And I must, I'll concur with what you said. In the audience, a young woman raised the issue of what, it, what can you do for the youth to involve them, to care about genocide, about this issue, and it really, it really was not answered. Thank, thank you for coming and for your observations. <laughs> Do you have a question or? I, I didn't have a question, just to <coughs> confirm that this evening's program is uh, something that recently I'm just found hard of, especially at Columbia University, where they continue to have conferences about um, making sure that genocides are not uh, erased with the ability of technology and uh, memory and genocide was addressed in a very recent conference. And I'm attending all of these things. Because although it's very complicated, I want to be up to date on what's actually happening. The truth, in other words. And if I don't get out there and listen and actually gather you know, as much information as I can, I, I won't be in the loop, I won't understand. And I do, and I've always been a peacekeeper. So it's, um, I, I'll never change. Um, you made a, a brief allusion to the silence in the Jewish community, too. Should we nail that definition? We're going to hear a little bit about, uh, much about uh, kind of what the Orthodox was coming out of my way. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, I think there's there's a lot of pressure being put on them by the administration. I, I'm not privy to what's going on internally in the ADL or the AJC. Uh, but you know, Erwin Kotler, who was the former Minister of Justice of Canada and the Attorney General, uh, yesterday he wrote that the Canadian Jewish News, which is not a major Canadian paper, and it's certainly not read widely, I don't think, in the United States, was saying how this interim agreement violates international law because of the UN Security Council passed many resolutions um, forbidding Iran to uh, process uranium, enrich uranium on their soil, and that sort of thing. And this agreement goes against international law. Um, these arguments are not being made in the United States yet. I'll just throw a comment on that one. Anecdotally, there used to be an annual protest against Iran's threats for decision against at least 5,000, 10,000 people came in the September session of the UN. I remember five years ago, organizations ran buses 
and a lot of Christian groups came with probably Christians and Jews. And this went on for five, probably stopped two years ago. And someone told me on a protest line, they did it because they didn't, they stopped doing it because they didn't want to embarrass President Obama. So for the last two years, there have not been any protests against Iran that the UN organized for the Jewish community, supposedly to protect President Obama. It's like the world's upside down. Yeah. And it, I agree. And it's not just the Jewish community. Last week we had a Professor Salim Mansour, who is a practicing Muslim professor of political science at the University of Western Ontario. And he spoke at McGill. And he's really, he's a learned scholar, intellectual, not just a professor, but a real intellectual. And he's saying how moderate Muslims who are concerned about human rights abuses of the Islamic world are also being silenced in the West. And that was the topic of his presentation. It's on our internet, on our website. If you have uh, 30 minutes, I would recommend watching this. It was from McGill last week. It's on our website. It's, uh, it's a serious scholar. You think Professor Connor's uh, article would be available somewhere? You yeah, you could look it up online. You, Canadian Jewish News of uh, two days ago, or yesterday. I think we did, yeah, yeah, we do. Erwin Cotler, Canadian Jewish News of yesterday's date. So any comments, criticism, statements? Okay, so. Uh, so thank you. So thank you for coming. Next semester, can I have the sheet? So next semester, we have, we have a really uh, an amazing lineup here at Fordham. On February the sixth, we have here uh, on your paper Emmanuel Altolongi, who was a professor at Oxford and he's now at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy in Washington. He's a serious, interesting scholar. We have my former student from Yale, uh, Alexandra Gravis, will be speaking. She's uh, she just won a major international award for legal uh, this legal studies, and she's a scholar of human rights. She's speaking. Ron Benatar, who's a professor here at Fordham, will be speaking. Jennifer Roskies, who's doing work on uh, gendered inequality and anti-Semitism, she'll be here. And Uzi Rabi who is the director of a very important research center, the uh, Moshe Dayan Center at uh, Tel Aviv University. He's speaking on Iran and, and Israel. It'll be very important. And we also, for those in New York, we also have a seminar series at Columbia University. So we're going to have a few sessions there as well. And all of our information is on our website. So please come and please tell people about this. And uh, I'm sure there'll be uh, inspiring uh, discussions. So thank you and have a great holidays. Thank you. Thank you.